Kellogg's breakfast cereals began in the USA, but they are now a truly international company. They have worldwide ingredient product sourcing and modern factories. They also have experienced marketing and selling subsidiaries in every part of the world, having very good contacts with supermarkets and other food chain distributors of their products. They also have a strong brand name, good quality products and a range that is tailored for individual countries. What this means for a company thinking of challenging Kellogg's is that the competitive advantage of Kellogg's is very substantial indeed and it's going to be tough to make headway against such a company. For the purposes of our case, we're going to focus on the European part of the worldwide breakfast cereal market and we're starting with late 1980s when Nestle was examining whether it would enter the market and if so, how. Nestle knew that the European market was large with a projected figure of 3 billion US dollars for 1990. The United Kingdom within that was the largest part of the European market with sales of 1.4 billion dollars. This was followed by Germany at $350 million and France at $250 million. From a strategy perspective, this data is already significant. The German population is the largest in Europe, yet their consumption of breakfast cereals was below that of the United Kingdom. This suggests that the UK might need to be treated differently from Germany in strategic terms. Not only was the European market large and therefore attractive, it was also growing much faster than other food products. Breakfast cereals across Europe had an average market growth of around 10%. This compared very favourably with other food markets like chocolate confectionery, where the growth was only around 1-2%. to For a company with the strategic purpose of growth in sales and profits, such as Nestle, breakfast cereals were much more likely to deliver its growth objectives. In BCG matrix terms, the breakfast cereal market would probably be classified as a star. Within the average growth across Europe of 10%, the UK was growing a little more slowly, around 7%. This reflected the greater size and maturity of the UK market. This lower growth was then counterbalanced by growth of around 14% in Germany, 15% in Spain and as much as 25% in France. Although much of the European market was still embryonic in strategic life cycle terms, there were some clear market segments in the early 1990s. There were three main parts to the market, staple products, healthy products and children's products. Although the children's market was the smallest segment, some strategists considered that it had the most potential because children were more likely to try new tastes and be attracted to strong brand concepts. And within each market segment, one company, Kellogg's, was both the market leader and was highly profitable, suggesting that the market was highly attractive. From a strategy perspective, this raises important questions of how a company tackles the European market. For example, do you treat the UK differently because it is more mature? Do you enter the whole of Western Europe simultaneously or do you pick off individual countries or groups of countries? Do you target particular market segments or launch products for all segments? All these considerations made Nestle very interested in the breakfast cereal market in the late 1980s. The market was large, but clearly still had growth potential and good profitability. The difficulty was that a dominant company, Kellogg's, would be very difficult to attack. In the late 1980s, Nestle had no manufacturing expertise in breakfast cereals, no breakfast product range, and no reputation in this product area. Clearly, one strategic option would be for Nestle to acquire a company making breakfast cereals, possibly even Kellogg's itself. But Kellogg's was a public company, so the acquisition price would probably have been high. 
perhaps well in excess of the profit stream from Kellogg's products after acquisition by Nestle. So Nestle needed to consider other lower cost strategic options. So now we have the strategic opportunity for Nestle in the late 1980s. A large, fast growing market, strong branding with good profit margins and clear market segments to provide entry opportunities. But there were also some real strategic problems. In essence, Nestle had no strategic resources in the breakfast cereal market. And then the company had a bit of luck. And we'll look at this in the next section. In the meantime, you might like to think about Nestle's strategy for entering the European market.